Well, hello again. As predicted and hoped, <laughs> I did in fact find out where our orphan bolt goes from the last uh, Thunderbird video. And uh, it goes to the shock mount. Yes, it does. The, uh, the, uh, the front shock goes down through the uh, coil spring. And this here bolts to the upper control arm as opposed to the lower control arm on most cars. And then this thing here goes through like so. And the uh, shock attaches to it. Nothing to it. I don't know why. I didn't think about it at first when I saw it laying there on the floor. Anyway, it also has a lock nut on it. And uh, I found that also it was in my uh, container full of bolts that I have there. The ones that I've already replaced. I replaced a lot of them. But I kept the old ones around just for a reference. And in the end, when I'm all done here, I'll throw them all away. Start over again on the passenger side. Anyway, unfortunately, these two items cannot be used. Now, the bolt is in, indeed hardened steel. Yeah, it, it has to be a hardened bolt because... That shock, I mean, that thing is like thudding and thudding and thudding all the time. Every time it hits a bump and everything, and you've got a lot of weight on that thing. Matter of fact, if you look at this right here, you'll see this is kind of bent. So I'm going to have to flatten that out a little bit. So the threads were rusty down inside. There's just not a whole lot left to them that could really give us a good measure of safety uh, to hang on to the bottom of that shock and these threads here are somewhat worn from being I imagine the shocks have been changed several times and I don't like the looks of that either the bolts a little corroded in spots so they don't cost that much so what I did was I went out and I bought me a brand new one yes I did I bought me a brand new one yeah right sure and uh, I got myself a flat washer to go on this side you know, why would I put a flat washer on that side when I already have a piece of metal here well I'm fixing to tell you we're going to put this lock washer on, and that lock washer, you know, it will collapse and it will dig into the metal as it collapses. And I don't want it to dig into the bracket that holds the shock. I'd rather it dig into this flat washer, okay? So I picked up those two. And then the last item I picked up was another lock nut. At first, I went out and bought, uh, I went out and bought a standard nut. Uh, to be used against the lock washer but then I got thinking I said you know these engineers I, I should not be second guessing these guys they had a lock nut on there to begin with I took those two bolt nuts back and I told the guys said, hey look you know I need a lock nut rather than this standard nut it was just as big as this you know only it was gold color and uh, how about an even swap out he said yeah no problem so he he's my regular uh, hardware guy so there we go that's how we're going to be hooking that thing up to the uh top of the control arm so we can put the well actually we're going to be bolting the whole thing to the bottom of the shock and then the entire shock uh, will slide down you know with this thing attached to it will slide down through the center of the coil spring and already hooked up and these three uh, bolts right here will go through the holes in the top of the control arm and then we'll tighten up these nuts on the bottom now keep in mind once again see this originally they had star washers on that thing uh, replace those things. Don't be using these old nasty lock washers and star washers and stuff. Get rid of that junk. It's very, very important. It's, it's a safety issue. You don't want the bolt coming out. And uh, the star washer works really good for this purpose because it, there's, you know, there's not, it, it, the, the pull by the shock is spread out among this entire bracket, so it's not all that bad. But uh, this is what they had originally, and this is what I put back on it. So brand new everything on that. All you got to do is straighten up this bent ear here if I can. I don't know. I may not. I may decide not to worry too much about that as long as I've got good solid uh, bolts and parts. So there we go. Long explanation as to where that stupid uh, wayward bolt went. We're going to toss this one out. All right, let's go underneath the uh, car for a little while longer. Uh, the front end is looking real good now. Nice and clean up under here. No rust. Oh, I'm just so happy about that. And uh, right after I get done with this, we're going to start working on the brake line. Yes, we are. And uh, the problem is uh, I've got to crawl under there. And that thing you see laying on the floor down there, the tie rod end. Let me uh, get into position here. Where everybody can see what I'm seeing. This tie rod end here, this entire thing is going to have to come off. It's just so loose. It's just loose as a goose. It shouldn't be that loose. Let me zoom in here. 
Yeah, that, that whole mess here is going to have to come off. That nut on the other side, you see right on the other side of that right there, that nut is going to have to come off. There's a cotter pin under there that holds the nut on. It's going to have to come out. Before we get back under there, though, we're going to go around. It's been a while since I've been under the car. We're going to check all of our jacks. We're going to make sure this jack is up the way it's supposed to be. Make sure the boards over here are in the right position so that, you know, I don't want anything falling on me. Always think safety all the time. It only takes a few extra seconds to go ahead and check that stuff before you, you know, just because you said it once doesn't mean it's going to always be there. All right, I'm happy. Everything's secure. Let's get under there. All right, she just broke loose. Get that baby off of there. First, I cleaned it out. You know, I cleaned all the dirt off around it with a wire brush. Makes life a whole lot easier if you do that. Get that crap off of there so your wrench will fit on better. And you won't uh, have any more difficulties beyond that. Get that baby out. Okay, there's that. Now, all I have to do is take my little... Uh, my little wrench right here and put it on the other side over here up through here like so and then hit it with my ball peen hammer and the entire thing will separate and come down that bolt you see sticking out right here will go back through the hole that way so let's start hammering this will give you a little better idea of what we're doing I just put the fork underneath the head uh, right here you see you put the fork under the head right there and then as the as the fork goes through it pulls this head back this way and pulls it right up out of there just got to hit it hard enough I may not have a big enough hammer I don't know I'm hitting on the end of the uh, on the end of the fork okay so I'm going to be hitting it pretty hard so probably going to take two hands we'll get that baby out of there She's out, and this is the part that connects to the spindle. This is the part that was laying on the ground. This is the part we hammered out with the fork and the hammer. This part is connected up to the uh, center link. Now, where I came from and the way I was raised, this is called the outer, and this is called the inner tie rod ends. But they don't call that in the manual. They call it the, uh, they call it the uh, spindle connecting rod. <laughs> <laughs> they, they call this the spindle connecting rod. This is the end that connects, you know, that was on the ground that connects to the spindle. And this part here, they don't even have a name for. <laughs> they just don't even. They just don't even show. It. They show it in one diagram, but the only thing they label is this one here. So I guess these are inner and outer spindle connecting rods. <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't matter. I always call it the outer and inner uh, connect, uh, connect uh, tie rod ends. And this sleeve right here, they call it the spindle uh, adjustment, spindle connecting rod adjustment sleeve. Oh, give me a break. Anyway, they're out, and, uh, you know, these are very, very expensive. Uh, this one here wobbles all around. You already saw it. I can move it with my finger. This is the nut we took off, and there's the, uh, the, the uh, cotter pin we removed that run right there comes right out just pops right up out of here anyway you know these two ends are very expensive they cost a bunch of money you you can't change this end like you can this one this one you can screw out and put the end on but it still costs a fortune this one here we'd have to change the entire rod because it's all one piece and again a small fortune however you know I, I'm gonna have to bite the bullet on this one already this one will have to be changed this one here I don't know you know this thing is very very you know, the rule of thumb is to change them out. Get rid of them. However, but this thing here, this thing here is really tough to move. It's really tight. But this one here, this one moves real easy with my thumb. You know, it just flops all around. It's just, just not, not a good thing to have. So, I don't know. I may have to wind up just saying to heck with it and buy new. But, you know, when they do a front-end alignment on your car and they, and they make an adjustment underneath there, this is the sleeve they loosen up. They take these bolts loose and then they turn this sleeve. And, you know, your lazy mechanics, your bad mechanics, as far as I'm concerned, they put a set of vice grips on there, you know, and then they start turning and they gouge it all up with the teeth on the vice grips. I had a guy one time doing that to my 57 Chevy. And I walked up and I said, hey, I don't want you doing that anymore. 
figure out another way to do it. Well, it's going to lose. I said, then get some get some WD-40 or some kind of lubricant in there, but I don't want you to. I mean, he had such big digs and gouges in there. I said, I don't want you doing it anymore. You're going to buy me a new one. He figured out how to do it. You know, these guys, they, they I don't know. They, some of them are just so bad, just so bad. So anyway, we'll see what we're going to do with this. I don't know, but uh, when they adjust, adjust the sleeve, you know, one way or the other, these two ends will go in or out because it's threaded down through the center of the sleeve. And then when they, they get the wheel the way they want it, and according to, you know, the crosshairs they have on the wall, uh, they, they, have, they hook these things up to project lights on, on this chart. And the trouble is, I don't think I'm going to be able to get this Thunderbird line downtown anywhere. But there is a plan B for all that. And uh, so uh, when you do change these tie rod ends, you've got to count how many threads uh, you know, count how many threads you got from here to there and try to get, when you change this, try to get the exact amount of threads. You have to write it down and make note of it. Try to get the exact amount of threads exposed when you screw it back in. Same thing over here. Same thing. Although in the past, I'm going to tell you, I've changed tie rod ends and put exactly the, the same amount of threads in there and they still were screwed up. You know, I had to really fiddle fart around with them back and forth for a while to keep the tire from squalling while I was driving it, trying to get the car downtown to get a front end alignment. Because if that tire's out of alignment, it's going to be it's going to be towed in so far or towed out that it's just going down the street. It's got to be flat. So, uh, or this way or that way, it's scuffing is what it's doing. And uh, so, you know, you got to get it as right as you can. But sometimes you have to go back home, make a little adjustment, unloosen these things, you know, jack your car up. Make an adjustment. Do the best you can. It's basically an eyeball. Once you set the threads and it's not working and you know that the threads are exactly where they were to begin with, after that, it's just a matter of eyeballing it and trying to get it downtown to where you can get it front in alignment. But like I said, I don't think I'm going to be able to get that done with this Thunderbird. I don't think there's anybody downtown and he can do it. They can even do an alignment on a Thunderbird anymore. All right, a little bit of an update on our brake booster, which you can see is still missing off the firewall. The more I thought about that brake booster, the more I decided that, you know, John, you've never rebuilt a brake booster. If I try to rebuild that thing and put it all back together and make it work, my confidence level would never have been where it's supposed to be. Every time I went to hit the brakes or every time I drive the car, if I ever get around to driving it, uh... I'd be worried about whether or not I did it right and will the car stop. I can't live with that kind of thing. You know, I've got to know that the brake booster was done properly and correctly with the right tools and the right torque and every other thing. So I went ahead and sent it to an outfit up in Portland, Oregon. It is called Power Brake Booster Booster Exchange up in Portland, Oregon. And no, it is not run by Buzz1151, our good subscriber up there. He probably wishes he did do it. <laughs> Anyway, they have a really good deal. They take your old one. I called them up. I spoke to the lady that answered the phone. She was very knowledgeable for a change. I love it when I can talk to somebody that knows what they're talking about. You don't have to, oh, well, let me talk to the mechanic. Or let me talk to this guy or that guy. She knew everything. And, and I, again, I was very impressed. Anyway, uh, she said uh, it takes about four to five weeks to get it rebuilt. I said, not a problem. You know, this car's not going anywhere for a few months anyway. And it's $175 to rebuild it, plus $25 shipping, and any parts they have to replace, you got to pay for those too. Again, you know, okay, I can live with that. So I told wifey, I said, uh, it's probably going to run about $250, bucks, maybe 275 to get that thing rebuilt. And she said, you know, this car is really running some money nowadays. And I said, well, I know we're to the point now where the, the big expenses are starting to come in. I've been kind of dribbling along. But I said, you know, if you don't want me to do it, uh, I can just, you know, forget about spending any big dollars on it. And I just stay in the house with you every day and instead of, she goes, oh, no, no, that's okay. It's okay. Go ahead and spend the money. Guys, you got to know how to play the game. Which brings us uh, to the next subject. Uh, you know, how much have I spent so far on this car? I had a budget of $2,500, but that was before I realized there was the car was basically unsafe. We can't put it on the road. So... I'd say right now I've got about not counting the tools I had to buy. I didn't have all the tools I needed, you know. So Brendan said, you know, you really don't need to count the tools because, you know, that's just basic stuff. Well, maybe so. 
with the tools, about thirty-eight hundred dollars is what I've spent so far. Without the tools and just the just the parts, about thirty-three hundred. So you figure thirty-three hundred, but I've been dribbling it along. You know, it's not like I have to splash it all out at once, which I could have. I could have just said to heck with it, take all the money, buy everything all at once. But it's more fun. I'm getting about fifty thousand dollars worth of fun out of this car, just making YouTube videos and talking with people, having a good time. But, you know, if it never gets done, it never gets done. I'm steady working on it. So, uh, let me see. Uh, let's, let's, just, let's just base it on parts I bought so far. Uh, about 30, we'll, we'll say about 3300 But I'm going to fudge it a little bit and say 3400 just to make sure we covered all the parts. You know, there's cans of paint and stuff like that that I probably didn't even remember buying. So, we'll say 3400 It's going to run about 250 to 275 for the brake booster, so that's 3675. And uh, probably the tie rod ends, if I get them, is going to be at least another 150. So 3675, 3775, about uh, 38, maybe around 38 and a quarter, 3850. You never know with tax and everything. So we're talking around between 38 and 3900 dollars is what I'll have invested in the car. But, you know, I don't drink and I don't smoke and all that other stuff. So the way I see it, I'm saving a ton of money. <laughs> and the wife's happy. Keeps me out of the house. <laughs> and look at all the joyous times we're having. I cannot wait. Uh, by the way, uh, we're going to be clearing out even more junk that's in here. Uh, today is Sunday. Yeah, what is today's date? Let me see what today's date is. Today's date is January 26th. Well, tomorrow, if everything goes all right, and as he, as he said, if the Lord willing and the creek don't rise, Johnny Humphreys, our northern Arkansas Yankee, is going to come down here. He's going to bring me a little vice. I've got something I'll trade him back. We'll put the vice on the bench, and that'll help a little bit. So he'll be here to see us tomorrow. That'd be good to see him. I like him. He's a good feller. And uh, he laughs at my jokes, you know. <laughs> as long as he doesn't bring Tony to two toes or whatever that guy is with him, he'll be okay. So we'll pick this up tomorrow when he gets here. We'll, we'll let it, I don't know if I, have I ever filmed uh, Johnny here at the garage? I can't remember. I know I did at a ham fest one time, but I don't know if I did it here in the garage. Anyway, we'll, we'll try to catch him tomorrow. Well, it is, uh, what is today? Monday, right? Monday. What's the date today? Uh, I don't know. 27th or something like that? We don't care, do we? We're retired. <laughs> and all, this is old Johnny Umpress, our Arkansas Yankee. Say hello there. Hello there. Hi, y'all. <laughs> this is my good buddy, Johnny. Anyway, he came down and he told me if I didn't give him more junk to fill up his truck, he was going to vote Democrat. <laughs> oh, we cannot allow that to happen no, under any that. circumstances. No. <laughs> no, boy, that's about the ultimate threat there. I mean, right. Killing me would be better. <laughs> anyway. anyway, he's making me some more room in my garage, and I am so happy about that. I'm More and more room. Pretty soon we'll have nothing but car parts in here and a couple of pinball machines. Oh, that's going to be great. I just love it to death. And we, we may make one more uh, swath through here to see if there's anything else. Whatever you want to get rid of. Whatever I want to get rid of. Yeah, <laughs> the, the Johnny, the, the Yankee junk man, right? <laughs> this here got hit by the water from the, the flood. Yeah, but this has a nice big speaker in it. It's got tubes. It's got a turntable and a radio chassis. You know, you can do something it's with just that. A, it's you know, just a flood damage. Just a flood damage, yeah. But he's a woodworking man. He can do all that. And Jeffrey B., you're always talking to me about my color TV. Why, when am I going to do the restoration on that color TV? There it is right there. <laughs> it's on its way to Johnny Ubers' house. Johnny, when are you going to do the restoration on that thing? Jeffrey B. wants to know. Uh, one of these days. <laughs> there you go, Jeffrey. <laughs> yeah, concise answer. <laughs> well, once again, I skinned old Johnny Ubers. You know, he, he took away all that stuff I didn't want, and in return he gave me a... My three-inch vise that he said he would bring down with him. All right, this is a this is a good solid vise. It'll work exactly for what I need. If I need a larger one at a later time, I can't imagine needing it though. I'll buy it, but right now this is going to take care of me. I'm going to bolt this baby over here in the corner. I originally was going to put it over in that corner, but Johnny said, "Wait a minute, you know, you want to leave that open so you can use this." I said, yeah, that's good. That's smart, you know. So this takes some. Uh, I need to go downtown and buy some three-eighths bolts. 
we're going to bolt that baby to the table that right underneath here is that one by six and we're going to be bolting down into that one by six so this is really nice i like this he said he used it for a long time said he changed the ball joints using this thing so it's pretty tough and uh we're going to have a nice little vice to work with. Oh, man, did I take him to the cleaners. We are getting ready to start doing our brake line on the driver's side. I want to get all that done. I want to get this uh, proportioning valve in. Some of you have asked about the proportioning valve. We'll get to it, but I needed brake line. But I want a brake line that I could easily bend. Uh, that brake line, that gas line that I put in bent, but not quite as easily as I thought it should be. So... I went shopping around and I found on eBay, this is uh, supposedly nickel, copper, and steel, an alloy. And uh, it came with uh, a bunch of fittings here. Now, some of the fittings are large. They all fit the tubing, of course, but they're really large. There's four of the large ones and uh, a couple of, couple of medium size, which is, again, too big for what I need. But then it also included 10 of the sizes that I uh, needed. So the first thing we have to do, and also with the 25 foot of brake line. So 25 foot of brake line <clears throat> plus the fittings, 10 of those, which is more than I'm going to need, and any extra that I might <clears throat> have a use for at some point in time, which I don't think I ever will. But anyway, it was 17 bucks. I thought that was an outstanding buy. So the first thing we have to do, uh, I have my, uh, I went out and bought this in preparation. This is our double flaring tool that I showed you earlier in another video. <clears throat> so what we're going to do now, before we do anything, is to make sure these fittings, you know, you have to slide your fitting over the tube and then do your flare. But we got to make sure these fittings are going to fit into these and they're going to fit into the master cylinder and the brass, I don't know, banjo fitting whatever they call that I don't know <laughs> so let's go ahead and see what will happen let's go ahead and see if one of these will screw into here first one of the ten fantastic fit perfect look at there all right now let's see if it'll fit in this bottom hole because we're gonna have to go into here from the front brake line the driver's side front brake line will come up and go in probably to the bottom here Yep, how about that? It may not go in here. This one may go down to my proportioning valve. I don't know. Let's go ahead and see if this other one's going to fit in there. I'm going to double check everything. Uh, you know, I've, so many times I've been shafted on this crap because the, the stuff had, you know, metric threads and all that that I didn't expect. Learn, you know, always make sure that the fittings you get on any brake line you buy, any pre made brake lines, make sure they're not metric. You know, I hate that metric deal. Drives me bananas. That fits okay. Now let's see what we got up in here. See if this one will fit. That one fits okay. Do we have any others? I don't think so. I think that's about it. Well, it looks like it's good to go. So all I have to do now that I, I, I know for sure. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, we got one more here. Come on, baby, get in there now. Come on, camera, clear up a little bit. Gosh, I dropped my camera a couple of times on the concrete here recently. <laughs> it fell right out of my hands. Oh, I'm surprised this thing is still functioning. It went bang. Well, there you go. Okay, that fits now, too. All right, I'd say we are good to go. All right, the next step is to uh, slide one of these down the tubing like that you always have to put that on first don't ever forget you flare your tube on uh, both ends and then you say oh geez I forgot to put those fittings on too late gonna have to cut the flare off start all over the temperature out in the garage is really really low it's I mean it is really cold out there but I want to get this video finished up tonight so I can get it uploaded now so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you a quick down and dirty short version of how to do a double flare using uh, on a, a piece of you know brake line or gas line in this case we're using 3 16 brake line and I cut a little piece off to you know let's assume this is you know four feet long okay now, I don't want to waste any so I just cut off a small piece to demo uh, how to do it and uh, 
What we're going to do, and I cut it using a small tubing cutter like this, and then I have another one that's a little bit larger. I wouldn't go much larger than this. Uh, you can see how si what size it is in my hand. I wouldn't go much larger than that to cut this tubing right here. You can, but I don't know. I, I, I really prefer this small one here. It does a much better job. I've had that thing, gosh, I, I think I was in my 20s when I bought that thing. Long time ago. Both made in the United States, by the way. <clears throat> anyway, let's turn this light on. Maybe this will help a little bit. Anyway, uh, you'll see that one end of this tube. Let me zero in here now. This is important stuff for those who have never seen it. One end of this tube is cut like that. And that's the end that I cut. See how it's kind of smushed in on the side and it's covering part of the hole? Now the other side is machine cut where they lopped off the 25 foot. And it's, it's about the same way. One side is always going to be kind of uh, mushed in on one side. And you can see around, you've got a, a kind of a ridge all the way around the outside there. This one, I don't have that. I just have the marks, the grease marks from the cutter. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this one here, this end that I cut. We're going to use it to do our double flare demonstration. Now one side of the flare, flaring tool, this is the actual flaring tool, one side of it is beveled. You can see it's beveled in all the way around each of those holes. And they're marked 3 sixteenths, uh, 3, uh, 3 sixteenths a quarter, 5 sixteenths, 3 eighths and a half. And they've got ridges down inside. That's to hold the pipe or the tubing or whatever it is you're flaring. And on the other side, there is no, there is no uh, beveled edge, it's strictly flat. Now I've inserted the brake line so it just barely sticks out of the top as you can see there. And I tightened up, now normally there's big large wing nuts uh, on these things that you tighten it down with great big ones so you can really get a good grip. But this one has a half inch, uh, I don't know, just a nut of some kind, <laughs> it's a tightening nut. Which I'm not, I'm not so certain I'm keen about because the, with the, with the, uh, with the large wing nuts, you never lose them. You know, this here, you could lose one of the nuts or strip it off or something. I don't know. Anyway, you'll see I've got it through on the flat side, not, not the belt side. And there's a reason for that. You have to have this surface right here has to be nice and flat. If, if it's not flat and it's, it's at an angle uh, and then you flare it, one side's going to be uh, off off kilter from the other you won't have you're looking for a nice even flare once it's done you want a nice even flare and you want it to have the same distance all the way around like so okay now if you don't if you don't you don't you don't want one where one side is uh, you know is, is wide and then the other one is thin like this that would not be cool at all okay you don't want that so that's what we're trying to avoid. So why did I stick it in there like that? Well, I'm going to take this little file. I'm going to use this as my flat surface. And I'm going to file this thing down until I get it nice and flat. I'm going to do it by hand. I'm going to file across this way with it up there like that. So it's nice and flat. There you go. It is nice and flat. It's nice and even all the way around. But, you know, there's still some edge on the inside of the hole from where I cut it. So I need to kind of ream that out with a blade. And you can use a pocket knife, you can use one of these box cutters. Stick it down in there and just kind of ream it all the way around till you get that, that flared edge or that just kind of edging off of there. I'll come back when I have it done. I'm just gonna spin that blade around and around, being real careful. It's very soft metal. It's not very hard, so it's easy to cut that stuff off. All right, that looks pretty good. It didn't take but maybe no more than six, seven seconds. It just gently cut that edge right on out of there. All right, now we're going to go ahead and take this thing out and put it in from the other direction. Now, just like there was an edge on the inside of the hole, there's also an edge all the way around the outside from where I cut it. So I need to take my file and kind of file all the way around that edge, put an ever so slight bevel but you know filing toward the hole once you have the uh, burr removed from the outside this is about what you're looking for uh, see that silver ring all the way around there there's no burrs on this thing at all no burrs in the center 
and no burrs on the outside edge, okay? Make sure it's, you don't have to go crazy with it, just kind of gently knock off uh, that burr and put a uh, somewhat, a somewhat beveled edge on it, that's all. I've now stuck it in from the other side to where the top comes out, the beveled uh, hole, side of the hole. And we're going to use this little baby right here. Now this is the 3 16 This will go down into the center of the tube when we get ready to do our next step. It'll go down the center of the tube just like that. But we have to stick the tube up a certain height. And I'll show you how that's done. Now that's how far you want it to stick out. Well, how far is that? Well, I'll tell you. It's the thickness of this thing right here in my hand. Right like that. Whichever one of these you use for whichever size tubing, you stick it out through the flared side of the flaring tool, the same height as this metal base of this thing right here. Nothing to it, huh? Pretty easy. Now, this particular tubing is pretty soft, like I said, so I got to be careful. I don't want to be smashing it together to where I collapse the tube. You know, so I, I, you want it in there tight enough to where these, these teeth right here will grab the tube and keep it from going that way when we use the next tool. So what we're going to do is we're going to stick this into here like so. And you notice it's got a little pointy uh, hole down in there. That little pointy hole down in there is what that pointy thing right there fits in. All right, now you kind of get the idea of what's happening here. These legs are underneath, and this pointy thing is down in the center, and we're fixing to collapse that uh, tubing. I'm just going to take this little wrench right here, and I'm just going to hold this thing with one hand, I hope. You know, like I said, normally the vice would be holding it, holding it for me. I'm going to try to hold it with my powerful hand and see if I can't tighten this up and get that thing to collapse. It's a soft tube, so I might be able to get away with it. Well, there it is after I smushed it down, but uh, obviously there's a defect in this tool. Some of you have probably already noticed it. See how this is not even right here? It's supposed to be nice and even like this. This is not even. I'm going to have to do something with this. Either that or take it back. I don't know why that lip is there, but it's throwing the uh, it's throwing the uh, this thing uh, off center. It was going in at an angle because this part of the tool is sticking out more than this. Anyway, we did get it smushed down, and you can see how pretty much looks. This side here, let me do a zoom in. I'll show you what happens when you have a tool that's out of alignment like that. That side there is pretty close to where it's supposed to be right there. But if you look at the other side, I may have to take this baby back, like I said. See, see what's happening to the other side over here? This is not good at all, that really, come on baby, focus in a little bit. Anyway, you can see it's kind of muffed up. Anyway, let's finish with the flare. So far, you know, so far the, the uh, demonstration I'm giving you is still, you know, still following uh, close to Hoyle, except for the tools a little whacked out. The next step is to uh, remove the first little thing we stuck in there and then put our tool our crimper back on and uh, just put the point directly in the hole on the tubing. See it? Now I'll go ahead and tighten this back up again, uh, making you know my powerful hands holding it in the rear. All right, that's now done. But once again, you can see that this offset, these two being offset, caused a, a, a space over here and no space over there. Well, once we put the fitting on, now that's a terrible flaring job because of the way it did. See, on one side, it's all mangled up there like that. That's crazy. This is what it was supposed to look like all the way around. Okay, nice and even all the way around. So it goes right up against that uh, beveled edge of the fitting as well. I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to fiddle fart around with this thing a little bit. It might have been my bad. I don't know. I'm going to fiddle fart. All I know is it's got that lip there still on this end. And this one, it's, I don't know. Let me fiddle fart around with it. And I'll see if I can't flare the other end and see how that one turns out. Well, we're going to go ahead and wrap this video up here. This little kit is going back tomorrow. It is really messed up. 
And uh, as you can see, I did not get a good flare on each end. But I do have enough that I can cut it off and practice again on another one that I'm going to buy. I'm going to have to find a better one, more precision made. Uh, this one was cheap. You know what they say, you get what you pay for. But anyway, you kind of got the idea of what we were trying to do here, I think. That's how it's done, even though mine didn't turn out very well. And I'm glad I practiced on a little piece like this first to see what would happen. But man, that's some boogered up stuff right there. Anyway, uh, until next time. Oh, one more thing, one more thing. Uh, the brake booster that I sent up to Portland, Oregon is in the mail and on the way back already. They finished it up in uh, three weeks instead of four to five and it came in about a hundred dollars under budget so i'm pretty happy about that even though this thing here messed up until next time this is john